Thank you, Peter, for the, the invitation. Um, and thank you all for coming out in one of the most miserable days of the, the year so far. Um, with the north of Ireland coming out of a period of conflict, um, the issue of addressing the legacy of the past is clearly something which is, creates a blockage. As we know that the Stormont House Agreement managed to address the economy, it managed to address the welfare state. Of course, not all of us were very happy with those uh, agreements, but the one that brought the Stormont House Agreement, in a sense, to a skidding halt was attempting to address the legacy of the past. And not, notwithstanding the RHI scandal at the moment, um, the legacy of the past remains, even if the RHI thing is resolved, remains a stumbling block. And that has created a vacuum. And in that vacuum have been up to about 50 community and academic-based initiatives to try and address a particular angle called sto around storytelling. And storytelling is a favourite term for memory work, for testimony, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you, I think a couple that you might be interested in would be accounts of the conflict at Ulster University and the storytelling network at uh, Healing Through Remembering. They're both excellent resources for many of those groups. Storytelling itself has been identified by at least three government reports. Um, the Bloomfield report of, I think it was 98, the uh, Eames Bradley report of 2009, and the Haas O'Sullivan uh, report of 2014. They dealt with many issues, but one of the issues that they dealt with was storytelling as one of the means. It doesn't replace a judicial inquiry or a truth recovery, but it's one of the means of addressing the legacy of the past. And as in many areas of life, civic groups are ahead of the politicians in this. We are just one of those. The Prison Memory Archive is one of those. And why did we choose the prisons? And it was um, a couple of reasons. There was kind of an organic growth in terms of as a filmmaker getting back inside the empty prisons, which I tried for many, many years, finally occurred. Um, but also the prison story itself is one of the most important. Sorry, is one of the important. I wouldn't say most, but it's one of the important stories. And this was evidenced um, not only in terms of what happened in the outside affected what it happened in the inside, but also what happened inside those prisons affected deeply what happened outside. But it was the hunger strike, you could say, was a turning point for the political group called Sinn Féin, which has become second largest party in the north, and I think it's third, fourth in the south. Um, that, that certainly led to the ceasefires. And another interesting aspect of the ceasefires was that the prisoners, particularly on the loyalist side, had to buy into the peace process. And Mo Molum, in fact, personally went in. I think she may have been the first Secretary of State to go in and meet prisoners directly. And she met the Loyalist prisoners deliberately to persuade them, to guarantee that the peace process was in their interest. So the prison themselves are a very interesting aspect of the peace process. Um, in 2006 and 2007, finally, after much negotiation with, first of all, the Northern Ireland Office and then the Stormont, uh, executive, um, also with the different constituency groups that we worked with. We finally got in in 2006 and 2007, first to Armagh Prison, Armagh Jail, and secondly to the Maze and Long Cache. We had two weeks, we were allowed two weeks in Armagh Jail, and we were allowed two weeks in the Maze and Long Cache, but we managed to push them for another week, so we got three weeks. And we've got about 35 stories from Armagh and about 140 from the Maze and Long Cache. Um, Protocols. What was really interesting for us or important for us was to devise a methodology that was consistent. And this was quite difficult in some ways because you're dealing with very, very different constituencies who need to be treated differently if you were to approach them to consider a project like this. But for us, the key was to try and get something that they would all buy into. And that created, and it's an awful cliche, a level playing field, that had a consistency, a methodology that was consistent across all of those constitu constituencies. The first protocol was co-ownership. And we know for a fact afterwards that the prison officers who took part would not have contributed if they had, did not have the co-ownership, and they said that to us. And the reason we wanted to go along with co-ownership was because, two reasons. One is it gives you access like the prison officers. But secondly, because these were very violent places, 
both for the prison officers and the prisoners, both for what happened inside, but also people's, what people were bringing with them into the prison, the stories that they were telling about before. Um, and when people are talking about traumatic events, there is a risk of re-stimulation. And I think the notion of co-ownership gives back some sense of co-authority. And it was Renos Papadopoulos worked with Bosnian refugees in London. And he talked about throwing out the psychiatric rule book and starting from a very, very basic storytelling basis again. Because what trauma does is it, it fragments your sense of self, your own story. And he said just remembering and telling your own story starts to put shape back again. And so for us, co-ownership, at least we hoped, was doing no damage. And the positive thing was that it was also bringing people on board who may not have been brought on board. The risks and rewards. The risk to co-ownership is that people pull out after everything's been done. And that's happened on two occasions. After David Black was shot dead, I think it's four years ago now, two prison officers phoned up the next day and said, take us out, destroy all our tapes. And we negotiated with them a moratorium. We would return in 10 years. So in six years' time, we'll go back and ask them if they want to be still considered um, or they want those tapes destroyed or moratorium extended. During the loyalist protests uh, a few years ago, we lost four loyalist prisoners and they want absolutely every aspect of their record destroyed. And this is the two reasons they give was the lawyer, was the flagged protest. They were withdrawing from public engagement. And the second one was the Boston College, because that was also beginning to emerge as a story at that point. I won't go into Boston College much, but you probably know that the entire archive of Boston College, which interviewed um, uh, uh, paramilitaries, ex-paramilitaries, um, is now sitting at Knock headquarters. And there's at least two people being charged on the basis of that, a loyalist and a republican. Um, so both of those contributed and the loyalists do not want a moratorium we've managed to keep most of the prison officers and most of the loyalists but it's, it's a serious loss to us to have lost um, those people and that's a risk the reward as I said earlier is that we still have 18 prison officers still on board and the second protocol is inclusivity we know that the prison remains in popular discourse the story of the Republican movement. In fact, that was the reason given when Peter Robinson pulled the uh, initiative to build the International Reconciliation Centre that Daniel Liebschkin had designed um, because it would be a memorial to, to terrorists. And for us, the range of stories from that prison was fascinating and we wanted to tell all those stories. And I think all of those stories could have been told if that centre had gone ahead, but that's another issue. That I think it's more to do with internal DU politi DUP politics than a, the bigger issue of inclusivity. Um, and so for us, it was crucial to get prison officers, um, to get the loyalists, to get the range. There are, we have probation officers, chaplains, solicitors, artists, artists and residents, tutors, uh, visitors. We have a couple of maintenance workers. The maze was such a big site that a permanent um, group of maintenance workers, electricians, Tara McLeaners, etc., etc. So we've got them as well. Um, and I think that's, for us, that's really important because any society coming out of a period of prolonged violence, there's, o there's often a preferred, a privileged narrative around that. And that, of course, is one of the reasons that the two main parties cannot, not only can they not find a, a, an agreed narrative, but can't even find an agreed way of addressing the different narratives and so for us those different narratives was absolutely crucial and that's also why I talked about that methodology stretching across all of them. We initially began with lists of questions that we would ask each group and this brings me on to the third protocol which is life storytelling. We found that we couldn't, we, 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 we had a set of questions for the prison officers and a set of questions for the prisoners for example and they were inevitably quite different and the filmmaker um, um, in within us finally re realised that we have a lot to learn from oral historians because one of the best questions a documentary filmmaker can ask anyone is silence because people will start talking. And what life storytelling does is it returns agency to the participant that they decide 
what it is that they want to talk about. And that returns to the co-ownership notion as well, that shared authorship. They decide. And so the methodology then uh, on those during, I think it was June in Armagh and August in the Maison on Cache, what happened was that we brought someone in, we sat down for 15 minutes and we discussed how this was going to work. And they told us what they wanted to talk about, a general kind of parameter. So the camera operators that went out with those people were under instructions to work with them in terms of teasing out what they had wanted to talk about, not to introduce any new subjects. Um, Some of our camera operators were a little bit naughty and couldn't resist asking certain questions of certain people. Um, But of course everything went back under the co-ownership protocol went back and if anybody wasn't happy with their contribution they could edit it. We decided to send one camera operator out with each participant. Participants were invited to do it by themselves or in a group. Most did it by themselves. Some did it with someone else. um, A relative, a sister. In the case of one uh, hunger striker from the first hunger strike, he took a sister around because she was the one who supported them all the way through it. And very interestingly, after he came back, we discovered that he didn't talk about the hunger strike at all. And so the downside of life storytelling is that people will say what they want and not necessarily what you want. Ed Maloney would have been disgusted with us <laughs> for not asking direct questions. Um, and I'm trying to think of other examples where people, where people, well, actually, I'll come to it later about some of the criticism we've had. And of course, every time you take a decision like that, you miss out something else. You're losing something, and we're losing by not asking questions. Very obvious information that we knew these people had, but they weren't prepared to give us. But I'll come to that maybe later. So that life. But the other interesting thing about life storytelling was that by sharing authorship, you start to share direction. And one of the clips I'll show you is Josie Dowds, who gave birth when she was a prisoner, a Republican prisoner, and she talks about raising her child for nine months before the child was handed over to its <coughs> grandmother. And she, she used the opportunity we give really well. In, in normal life, she's a very quiet person. But as soon as she realised how this was going to operate, in other words, it was a radio mic, it was only one person, it was a conversation, take off and we will follow you. And you can talk with your back to us. Keep talking. We'll hear everything you say. And she engaged with that co-direction with great confidence. Unlike some other people, um, I, I did one filming of a prison officer. And because he was still a serving prison officer in McGabbery, he actually did the almost the entire interview with his back to the wall, which was the safest place to be for a prison officer. Um, so that, that was the third one then in terms of life storytelling because what it allows, the, because we chose a frame which was both physical and in a sense thematic of the prison, it meant as a filmmaker you, you, you witnessed people performing their memory and that's one of the most remarkable things about taking people back to the site <laughs> Not only do they remember things, and some of them said this, I remember things I, hadn't, I thought I'd forgotten, because you're back at the site of the experience. But secondly, people, the best examples are when people perform the memory. As they walk around, they point, they gesture, they pause, um, they discover something, um, etc. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay. So we'll move into... I'll show you a couple of clips, okay? The first clip is Josie Dowds. And Josie was... Armagh jail closed in 87. Um, the women were moved to McGabbery. Um, but we were back. And so the, the prison has deteriorated considerably. But that's because it had closed about 20 years before we actually filmed there. It had been used for film sets, which is kind of interesting because some of the, some of the prisoners come back and said, it didn't look like this when I was here. And that's because it was paint. Some of the wings were painted up for film sets. Um, okay, what I'll do is just, Margaret, would you mind when I when it comes on if you would just switch those two lights? Oh yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. So this is Josie Dyes. And these are online. You can actually go and watch these. Is that enough light off? That's fine. Yeah, I think so. 
This is PC, isn't it? Let me see that. So it's one in the event. Is anyone a PC person in the room? Well, here it is then. Yeah, just there. There we are. Thank you. Come here. Prisoners on this thing until they were sentenced. Well, because I was pregnant when I came in, I spent the first seven months of the and then was sent down to the bottom wing for safety reasons. The city, which is all right here. The gate was kept locked. sisters moved into this down to these couple of cells after Kevin had got home and they changed this whole area for I think it was stores in the barrier and it was all blocked off when I left it was all blocked off so they changed yeah that would have been my cell at the minute it says obviously was turned into a kitchen at that stage but Kevin would have been with me and we use this cell for the, they're all the same. It's quite dark in there, mind you what. Um, and I had again a back door, cord open the way, top, sit down and write the bed, and another cover behind the door. And my bed might have run along the top of the radiator, and Kevin's cot would have come down this way. And I brought Kevin back to this cell. Um, Kevin didn't lose out as far as love and affection was concerned. There was plenty here to give up. He was the only baby in the wing. And at night, when we go into the cup, we'd sit and play with him. Uh, he had a really confession, infectious giggle, which could be heard all over the wing. The echo, the whole wing in the prison. Uh, <laughs> I want to have a bath or do something, I just wanted an hour on your own. And the other girls would have, would have took Kevin, who was fighting over Kevin as Kevin. He wanted to play with him and whatever else. And the day that Kevin was going out of here was very hard on not just himself, but every girl, every girl in here at that time. And I came out of that cell, walked out, to the visiting room to hand Kevin over. Could have been. I'd say maybe 10, 15 years on each side of this from here on out. And every one of them was crying. And saying my goodbyes to him. I was actually trying to cheer them up. <laughs> remember. After Kevin had went out, I was then moved up stairs to B2. And that's where I ended up. That's where I ended up the last year or so. After he went out, I didn't mix very well. I liked to sit in the cell and lock the door and lock. I didn't really want company of any description. The night he went out, I shared a cell with the girl. She was doing life. I was sad and um, thought I think I pulled my heart out that night to the end of she cried and said, Okay. Memories of the girls. There's definitely memories of the girls. And that is. Three years, I don't know how we managed to do it, but like everyone else, she had to do it. 
I hope you can hear at the back okay, because there's a second one coming up. He's also got a quiet voice. The air conditioning off, that might help. Do you want to, you want to move forward? Because John's going to, John's going to speak next, so you can forward. Sorry. It's all right. Please do. One of the things about uh, Josie that's interesting there and the relationship with the camera operator, um, we had to brief the camera operators as well as the participants because as she's walking down the stairs, you notice the camera operator sees the scene and pans up, tilts up. Normally what she would probably do because she was a news gatherer was she would have dropped the camera, turned it off, caught up with Josie and then started filming again with a cut for the edit. It was a beautiful moment for cutting, but we had said this is for an hour time. This isn't for a linear film. And so they had to think in terms of filming everything, not cutting. The only time they... And they did cut at certain times, moving from inside to outside. The light changed so quickly. They, they would cut round and try and change it. Um, and the other thing was that we, we wanted the... We were careful that the camera operators themselves didn't receive transference of trauma because when you listen listen very deeply and carefully to someone who's been traumatised, you yourself can, be, can get secondary traumatisation. And so we offered the camera operators the opportunity of a briefing beforehand. And Deirdre, this camera operator, said, I'm a news gatherer. I can't afford to. I do this every day. So I'm used to it. I don't need this. And we asked if she would consider it. And she did. And it shows in her work. Because I think both in terms of her attention and there was a moment when Josie goes silent and then remembers her, her, something about Kevin, uh, a, a news gatherer would be in there with a question very, very quickly. And I suppose I remember being at the University of Southern California, and the Shaw Foundation said, because they've got 30,000 hours of material, I think they said that one of the biggest problems with the interviews, there were so many spread all over the world, was that when they employed people, they were not in a position to brief them personally all, or in time. And one of the, the regrets they have is that when someone, a survivor of that genocide, paused, the person was so on age, the interviewer, that they would often come in with a question. They wouldn't stay, be present for the other person. They would jump in with a question. And that for us, that was really important that the camera operators didn't push, stay back and let people decide what it was they wanted to remember and how to articulate it. Um, I want to show you something in contrast because it's about performance and Josie moved really quickly and, and Deidre had to run around you can see her trying to get the silhouette out and keeping the silhouette in and then moving and Josie, <coughs> oblivious, let Deidre walk in front of her behind her just kept talking John actually comes, he's a prison officer and he comes to the age of the hospital wing and he's about to go into the hospital wing but he's physically hesitant he kind of takes a step in and then stops and this mirrors memory work because he's telling us this is difficult. This is difficult to come in and this is difficult to remember because this was not a nice time to be a prison officer. So I'll show you John's um, because you can, you can both hear and see the difficulty in him remembering something that was very, very painful. And John's quite exceptional, I think, in terms of prison officers being prepared to discuss and think about
it was difficult not to feel uh, you know, human pity for, for what was happening here. But perhaps even some type of but at the same time one had to uh, carry on with one's duty and try not to put too much thinking was there and all those things. It didn't mean that we were mindless morons at all, but it just meant that well, when you're dealing with issues like this, especially emotive issues like this, it's perhaps best just to try and, if humanly possible, and then a little detached. Um, I wasn't always able to achieve that, of course. But I certainly felt a great deal of pity and sympathy, especially for the relatives that we met from time to time here. Makes me sad, um, very sad when you think about that. Um, I know hindsight is very wrong when I put things in context, in context, but when I actually look back and think about you know, what happened here at that particular time, how emotions were highly charged, positively, negatively, it's a time I've never really been able to come to terms with. It's a time I've never really visited that often actually in my own mind. It's a place that I remember really in the periphery of my memory rather than actually go back there in the ways that I, that I do visit some places. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that if there are ghosts that are here, I think there are ghosts in the maze. The maze itself is a ghost. It's a ghost of another time. But it has the ability to reach out and still grab your soul in a way. I know, I suppose, like many who worked here or were present here, that no matter what people say publicly, deep down uh, this place has a grasp of your inner being, uh, for good or ill. And it's it's impossible to put in words. It's difficult to speak about it without being emotional. It's a difficult subject. But this is a part of the maze that will be in my very bones the day I die. And to see it like this is very, 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 very strange, very difficult to deal with. This is a hard place for me to deal with. Um, I wonder why I came here. I'm glad I did, but uh, I don't know. But I think of the things that happened here, one or two of the things that I saw, and it's difficult to believe that I was here. This is something that's happened to someone else. It didn't happen to me. And yet I know happened in another world in another time. It's difficult to read about it today because the people who mostly write about it weren't there. Um, it's difficult to feel the wrongs of those times. Um, and when I, I see uh, the images that are portrayed today uh, of those who died here, can't help but feel sadness. That somehow, even if it was what they intended, that maybe the memories would be hijacked by history. But I suppose that's what happens to everyone. We're never remembered the way we actually were. And perhaps we don't even remember ourselves the way we were. It's a difficult place. I don't know whether I can actually go much further here, but I'll try. Um, this is the most difficult place I have been in many years. And, uh, it's hard. Okay. Come out of this. So we have, since we got the funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund in 2006 and 7, two separate lots, it's proven actually very difficult to get funding since to post-produce the material. And we think it's partly because um, 
the sensitivity. I think the whole International Reconciliation Centre debate was not particularly helpful for us. Uh, piece 3 was a natural for us, the storytelling strand, but again, we didn't get anywhere with it. So we had small iterations as we went along. Uh, a couple of scholarships, um, small grant from the CRC to allow us to do, this is just the tip of the iceberg, the internet site that you can access. And a big concern, of course, is that any proposed oral history archive, and I know that Anna Bryson has done some work on this, and Healing Through Remembering are very concerned, is that they're talking about 10, 15,000 oral histories, that it may become an, a, an assembly line, an industrial belt. And you need to be very careful, uh, and you need to deal with people individually. Um, so we, we hope, and we've been invited to address the Knowledge Exchange Seminar Series, uh, we're told politicians don't come to that, but it'd be great if some of them did, so that they could understand that this is a lot needs a lot more time, resources than is proposed under any stormatized agreement or a history archive if it ever gets off the ground. So to finish on a positive note, finally, we showed some of this at the public record office. It was the launch of Laura McAtackney's book on the archaeology of the Louis and Long Cache. She invited us to come because she had someone from Prony talking about the textual archive, which is fascinating. I mean, not only has it you know, got Lord Gowrie's notes or memos to uh, Jim Pryor, but it also has the smuggled, some of the prisoners smuggled comms. So it's a very, very rich material. And she wanted something which was about people. Um, telling a story, the visual. So we complemented each other really well. And the director came up afterwards and said, we need to talk. We want that archive. Now, and we, this last year, we've put in, been working on an application with the Public Record Office, and just before Christmas, we've got the funding. So will the whole archive, 300 hours, 175 interviews, will go into the Public Record Office. That is another talk in itself, because the... The different cultures, the different language, the different understandings of what an archive is have meant a lot of negotiations.